Can I can I try to respond? Sure, absolutely, Is please. Can you hear Thank me? you. Okay. Is your button up? Yes, it's yes, it's up. Thank you. Um, I understand what you're saying. Um, if you look at the the part of the statute that we're talking about, it also talks about the validity and enforceability of the provisions of the bar uh, of the collective bargaining agreement, um, and and the vacation of uh, an arbitration award, or it, it can't be vacated or remanded or set aside on the basis of a conflict. What that, where that came from um, is this. If there's an, um, uh, if an employee commits what we consider to be misconduct, and the director has the appointing authority and the person with the authority to run the department decides to discipline that employee. Let's say, let's say the employee does something really awful and the director decides that this person can't work here anymore, I'm firing him. He obviously has a right to grieve and arbitrate that termination. What, if the arbitrator decided that yes, that misconduct occurred, but I don't think termination is appropriate, that's too harsh, so I'm going to say he should have gotten a suspension. When that, before this passed, um, that would be overturned in court because the Supreme Court has said that once an arbitrator agrees with the director that misconduct occurred, he can't tinker with the penalty. Um, and so that was a source of some consternation, as you can imagine, for members of the Brotherhood. And so th this statute actually says that um, not, not only in the areas of, of wages that we're talking about, but in discipline, that if the director determines a penalty against an employee and an unelected, unaccountable to the public arbitrator decides, no, that person can still work inside the prison, I'm going to put him back and just impose a, a suspension, there's nothing we can do about that because it sort of overrules the Supreme Court's opinion in the prior case. The case arose, actually, uh, the case that led to this chain of events uh, was one in which, as I recall, the facts were that uh, a correctional officer uh, was, uh, was not uh, present at work for an extended period of time, and we learned that it was because uh, she was incarcerated in a correctional institution in Massachusetts and failed to tell us the truth about that. So she had, so she had uh, violated the criminal law, uh, done time, and lied. And uh, the arbitrator in that decision felt that termination was, uh, was too harsh a penalty. It went to the Supreme Court of the state, which said that when you're running an organization like the Corrections Department, you have to have a tight ship. You have to hold people accountable. You can't have others who don't have this, the experience and the responsibility of running that kind of agency making these sorts of decisions. So that was the Supreme Court decision and, uh, uh, and the General Assembly subsequently uh, enacted this provision. It, is, it happened to arise in the context of discipline. We're talking about it here in the context of cost savings, but it's, uh, it's all part and parcel of the same. Okay. Any questions for the director? Well, hearing none, director, if you have anything else you want to add or wrap up? Uh, simply to say that uh, this will not uh, mandate a uh, that, uh, that the work week uh, be altered. It's simply that we can't even negotiate it without this change in the statute. Uh, and in the first year, the estimated savings are only of 325,000 because we anticipate a period of time starting July 1st when negotiations will be underway. If, however, uh, the, uh, the change is made and those negotiations are successful or, uh, or the outcome is such that it favors changing the law, uh, the savings would be on the order of uh, about $1.3 million a year. As I said, Corrections knows it has to do its part and this is something that we offer for your consideration, and the governor, uh, governor does as well. Thank you. Representative Riley, question? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Real briefly, Director, um, just two quick questions. Uh, when someone calls out sick, I'm assuming you have minimum manning for each shift? Uh, we have, uh, the contract doesn't speak specifically to minimum standards. Uh, certainly, we know in our experience what is required to run a safe shift. So do you have a situation where if someone so there isn't a minimum baseline, so if someone were to call out sick, you have to call someone in at that point, or is there some sort of 
gray area where you can operate with less than right. the desired minimum, but it's still safe and you're allowed to operate without calling someone uh, The second is true. Those decisions are generally made by the uh, superior officers, the shift commanders. Okay. And then the only other question, um, a little broad and related to what we were just discussing, was um, as far as your shift system, you're on a three-shift system? Yes. Now, have you found that that's optimal, or has there ever been any discussion? I know we have police departments down on Aquinnick Island talking about moving to a four-shift system. Mm -hmm. I know that's that's a big change, but has that ever been discussed? Is it Would that save money? Would that improve staffing? Would neither be the, the case? Uh, there are differences of opinion. Uh, I will say that uh, some years ago, about uh, 10 years ago, I think, uh, we... Uh, we, the department, wanted to open the door to the possibility of 12-hour shifts, which is the way many correctional uh, corrections departments have gone. And uh, their experience has by and large been positive, although some would say that it hasn't. Uh, so we have, we've looked at that. Again, we couldn't go in that direction because the General uh, Assembly uh, was at least at that time not willing to, uh, yeah, and I only, to enact this change in law. And I only bring it up because with the change in Article 22, with the overtime being calculated on the base of the of the of the pay periods, as opposed to on a week to week basis, wouldn't that would that give you more room in contract negotiations to change shifts in terms of how the because there would be guaranteed overtime built into a contract if you had say 12 hour days, would, but would this change help that uh, or the, make it easier? Uh, we couldn't really even discuss possible changes to the current pattern of shifts unless this law were changed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Riley. Appreciate that. Um, any other question? Representative Canavali. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sir, let me see if I get this straight. If a CO works an eight-hour shift presently mm -hmm. and is held over do they get paid overtime? Let's say they held over four hours. Do they uh, get paid overtime at yes. this point in time? And if this law was enacted, they would not be paid overtime. I think, go ahead. Yeah. Right, uh, the, we're saying this law, Trish was saying to me, this law opens the door to those kinds of negotiations. It doesn't mandate that they lose that time. All right. Let me see if I get this straight. Would they or would they not get paid overtime for those four hours if they're held over? Uh, I think if it's mandatory. It's hours, if it's yeah. not presently, not mm -hmm. presently, if the change takes place. Yeah. Hours. Right. It depends on if they're working the full 40 hours that week. So if they work the full 40 hours, they would? Anything over 40 hours, they would get paid time and a half. That's okay. current. That's current, correct. Current. So anything, what, we, what we're trying to propose is um, a 28-day cycle. So it, any hours worked over 171 hours within those 28 days, they would get overtime. Currently, it's 160 hours. Okay. So we're saving 11 hours each month at an overtime rate. Um, the overtime rate is $43.96, and it would go down to straight time for twenty-eight ninety. So we'd save about $15 on those 11 hours. So that's where the savings comes in. So if this was changed and they were held over against their will, but they had to stay, and they did an extra four hours, unless they hit 171 hours in the 28-day period, they would not be paid overtime for that four. They would only be, they would be paid straight time. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much, uh, Director. We appreciate you coming in. Well, thank you, Chairman Mello and members of the committee.